Well, hello, Jacksonville Prez. This is Scott Matson, the Director of Discipleship and Missions here at the church. And I am very excited for the video that we have for you today. Uh, on this Meet Your Missionary video, we are talking with Robert and Joyce Hum, who are missionaries to Beirut, Lebanon. And uh, they are going to tell us about the work they're doing over there and what God is up to. Um, and we'd also like to just hear a little bit of an introduction just so we can all get to know you guys better. Great. Yeah. So you want to start? You want to start? Ahead. So um, I was raised in uh, Saginaw, Michigan. Yeah. Okay. I was born, uh, my mom and dad came from Beirut, Lebanon uh, in 1949. And uh, they ended up settling in mid-Michigan. I always often would say, dad, why, why couldn't you have like settled in, you know, the West Coast, perhaps, or something San Diego, like that. or something. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. Well, why Michigan? But there's a there's yeah. a huge Arab population in the Dearborn area, right? Uh, one of the largest Arab populations. That's kind of where he landed. Um, but my mom and dad were both uh, from uh, uh, an offshoot of Shiite Islam called Druze, D R U Z E. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, growing up outside the home, we were American. We spoke English. Dad had a business. Inside the home, we were very much, uh, you know, that multicultural family with Arabic spoken, Arabic food. Mm. Um, and uh, that was kind of my growing up experience. But I was always kind of like taught that those, you know, we're not like we're, we're Lebanese. We were uh, uh, Druze and, and so forth. And it wasn't until I was 12 years old that I was invited to a summer camp. And I don't think my parents actually knew it was a Christian summer camp. Oh. Uh, but you know, when you got a 12 year old, you want to send them off for the yeah. summer. I think my dad, yeah. uh, he asked how long the camp was and he was told <laughs> two weeks and I think he was disappointed. He was like, that's it. Or, I mean, I'm <laughs> joking about that, but, yeah. uh, sure. Sure. but sure. that was where I, I heard the name of Jesus for the first time mm. in my life. And, uh, my heart was absolutely pierced and mm. I, just, man, I just, my, it was revolutionized my life and yeah. I committed my life to Christ and serving the Lord wherever he would lead. And uh, the first person I shared the gospel with was my dad. And this is what my wow. dad said. I said, dad, he said, how was summer camp? I said, good. And I said, I have something to tell you. He said, what is it? And I said, I met Jesus. And my dad said, good, don't tell anybody. <laughs> oh, no. They're not supposed to convert. Yeah, right. they're not supposed to be Christians. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So I've been yeah. telling, yeah. telling about Jesus for since, since I was 12. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Wow. Interesting. And as a, as a follow-up to that, I, I'm just curious, uh, is the pressure on the Druze specifically not to convert? Is it maybe about the same as the pressure on Shia and Sunni Muslims? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, and for Druze, they, they, um, uh, it, it's a small sect. So conversion is a huge no, no, it's okay. a huge no, no. Because yeah. they don't, they, you can't convert into being Druze. Oh, like I, you could not be Druze. I cannot be Druze. Your mm. father has to be Druze for you to be Druze. So it's, oh. it's both a sect and almost an ethnicity because it is okay. about the bloodline. Yeah. Okay. So that's part of it. So all of that is in play then when a, like when a person like you, Robert becomes a Christian. So yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, you know, and then Mary's an American. Mary's an American. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then there's no hope. There's yeah. hardly any hope for the next generation, but yes. yeah, we've been married for 33 years this summer wow. and we have three kids. Um, our eldest is Ben and he lives in Nashville. He's a commercial realtor. Our second son is Joseph and he is a teacher, a high school teacher. He's taught Arabic oh. for the last six years and he lives also here in the DC area. And then our youngest child, Lydia, um, and her husband, Darius, just got married last year, and she is a French high school teacher and also a special ed teacher. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's about our whole family now. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's great. That's great. And um, when did you two meet? We met in 1980. Four, I think four, okay. four or five okay. in, um, in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where um, oh. I had lived in high school. Yeah. So we went to, um, we went to the same church. Like I came late for the service and he turned around to talk to his friend behind me and, and talk to me instead. And then we wow. just struck up a conversation and that was it. Yeah. Oh, actually she, she knew a little bit. Of I Arabic. knew a little bit of Arabic at that point. Yeah. Okay. Cause I have worked 
youth with a mission for several years. And so I okay. had traveled a bit myself already mm -hmm. and learned, you know, some other. I mean, I fell in love with those stuff. blue eyes and she spoke <laughs> Arabic. And I thought, there you go. What and you met her in church. I mean, what more could you want? Yeah, true, yeah. true. Yeah. So that was wow. it. And then we first went overseas in 1994. Yeah. And um, that was Jordan. We were in Jordan okay. for a little while learning Arabic. And then yeah. we were in France for a bit. <laughs> and then 14 years in Lebanon um, with a time in Louisiana in between. So okay. seven years in Lebanon, Louisiana, and then seven years in Lebanon. Oh, and okay. We're, now we're based here in D.C. and we go back and forth to Lebanon. To Lebanon, um, okay. To monitor the preschool that Robert's the director of. Wow. Wow. What a fascinating story. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Very cool. Well, thank you guys for introducing yourselves. And um, I'd love to hear, and the people I know watching this video would love to hear uh, some of the specifics about uh, the ministry that you all are involved in and, and the school that you're running, Robert, and, and just... Right kind of what you're doing and what that all looks like and the name of it and just kind of everything. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, so uh, our first stint in Lebanon, I was part of a church plant. So I've been part of two church plants in Lebanon and both of them are still going and still thriving. Uh, the second church plant was amongst um, in, in the city of Beirut, mostly with marginalized and underserved Lebanese, uh, uh, Syrian refugees and migrant domestic workers. Uh, Oftentimes I, I tell people slavery is alive and well, mm. and it operates under different guides. Uh, and in the Middle East, primarily, it's, un, it's under the, the terms migrant workers. And so what happens, a migrant worker will come to Lebanon thinking they're gonna get a good job. Mm. And what happens is that their passport's extracted from them. They're placed in a, a home or a business, and they, ought, they work often long hours. They are unprotected laborers uh, and they're exploited. Uh, and this is the kind of conditions that we were noticing there. Yeah. Meantime, I was part of that church plant and I was working with the dom migrant domestic workers. And what happened was I just kept seeing this, this cyclical incidents happening with them. We would help and then they would improve and then they would come back and the, just the problems were just a cyclical problem. So I knew that what we needed to do was shift our focus somehow to make some structural changes. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, while I was doing that work uh, and pastoring the church, uh, a woman came into our church, uh, Scott, and she was uh, um, an Ethiopian woman who was uh, 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 abused, assaulted. assaulted by her Lebanese employer, and she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. She had run away from that employer, and she was seeking six hundred and fifty dollars uh, for an abortion. Wow. And uh, she knew that we help people. She knew we help migrants, in particular, and so. Uh, the women of the church and so forth just said, you know, pastor, let, let's see what we can do. And so we, we walked with her and we journeyed with her. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and through that experience, that connect, that, that connectivity with her, learning her story and walking with her, uh, she came to faith and trust in Christ. Wow. She delivered the baby. Mm -hmm. And about six months later, Scott, she went to find a place to put the baby in with some of our, our team members. And what they found, Scott, was just, uh, was just it, it's unimaginable. We, they walked into a, a room where they saw 30 children tied to chairs along the wall. As this was like a daycare, you know, she was looking for somewhere to, to, yeah. to keep her child during the day so that she could work. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, my team came back just visibly distraught. And, and they said, you know, we talked to the, the person who ran this thing. There was no toys, no nothing. It was mm -hmm. just a TV and children tied to chairs. Yeah. And I said to the staff, I said, we need to go back unannounced several times to, because the woman said, hey, I, I do that because I was feeding them. And so our staff did. And this was back in 2011 when smartphones were just coming on with cameras. Yeah. And so we we captured photographs and, and recorded that that's that really bleak situation, and uh, yeah. uh, that was kind of like the seeds. What started yeah. it? Yeah. I um, while I was doing that, Scott, uh, I was working on my dissertation with Fuller Theological Seminary, and I landed on a study that just revolutionized me. And so this is where we shifted our focus. Mm -hmm. So what happened was God used these very dark situations that we were encountering. And oftentimes when we encounter difficult things, we either can retreat or we can figure out how to navigate through these various, 
they're difficult situations. And so I landed on a study called the Perry Preschool Study that was done in Ypsilanti, Michigan between 1963 and 67. And so they were done by social scientists out of the University of Michigan. And what they wanted to find out was why some children excelled in school and some children didn't. That was just their hypothesis. Sure. And so they took two control groups of children, both underserved, both at-risk children. They, they had an assumption that children in intact marriages and children that were looked like time and attention were spent on them, they sent them to do well. And so they created what they call a pro-social preschool. And what they did is lots of language, reading routine, and just creating a, 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 a safe environment and so they ran the program for five years and then they lapsed the program. They let the other group just stay. Where So so two okay. groups of at-risk kids. One, they put in this preschool. Yeah. The other group, they just kind of left, you know, to their normal, whatever would happen to them with their families and sure. you know, the struggles that their families were having. Yeah. Okay. And so they, they, they lapsed the program because they wanted to do a longevity study and they lapsed it for 40 years. Sure. Now, that's a very yeah. huge commitment. Uh, as a social scientist uh, to commit to 40 years. And they, yeah. circled back to the, they circled back to the both control groups at 45 years old. And what they found was staggering. The mm. children that were in, the, in the, the, pre, the pro-social preschool intact marriages higher, sending children to college, uh, longevities in job, bankruptcies lower, incarcerations lower, drug addictions lower, divorces lower. Wow. Uh, the numbers were just absolutely staggering. But it wasn't social scientists that initially picked up on the study. It was actually economists, uh, like the London School of Economy picked up on it, University of Chicago, mm -hmm. MIT, other schools, Stanford, they picked up on it. And what they did was they, they took the numbers that they invested in the children in those yeah. five years, mm -hmm. they atomized it, and they calculated it to 45 years later. And what they found was that for every dollar spent in early development, created a $13 return. Wow. To society, to society, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, like, because it created functioning members of society right. who, yeah. you know, were were making society a better place <clears throat> as opposed yeah. to taking from it. Yeah, wow. exactly. That's amazing. So as, as a missiologist, and I know mission dollars are tight. Yeah. It's hard to get missions. I thought, that's it. If, if we can invest in anything, if we can create a $13 return into Lebanese society or into the Middle East society where we want to go, yeah. we're going to do that. And so I shifted everything. Hmm. I, I, I de-engaged in the church plant and moved into creating what we call the Philemon Project. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I termed it Philemon Project is because I think this is an impressive book of 22 verses where Paul critiques slavery in, mm -hmm. in, in an uncanny way, mm -hmm. where he tells Philemon, who was a very wealthy presider of the church, presider where we get the word president from, who they, you know, had slaves, had, had a large estate, and, and, and was a very connected person in society. And so he used his estate as the church base. Yeah. And so he had a runaway slave who perhaps did him wrong, whether it was embezzlement or theft, something of that nature. And in those verses, Paul says, he says to Philemon, Philemon, you have every right under law uh, to have Omniceros uh, to be repatriated back and for you to execute judgment on him. Right. But Paul says something very interesting. He says, if that's what you want to go, and the, the, the Greek kind of hints at that, Paul is saying to him, Philemon, if, if that's the direction you want to go, then you owe me everything because under my ministry, you came to faith and trust in Christ. Mm -hmm. So your, your, your estate, your farm, your slaves, your houses, they actually belong to me. So if you want to go you know, tit for tat and you want him to pay the penalty, then you actually owe me your life. Right. And so that is a critique because he says, receive him back as a brother. And so there we, we get the impulses of how the gospel is transformative. It's not only transformative of the soul of a human being by converting and changing and transforming, right. but it also is calling for us to impact society, transform change and impact society. And that's why we called it the Philemon Project. And so what we did is we created a Lebanese NGO, which is a legal NGO. And what we are focused in are early childhood development and adult mentoring. Mm -hmm. And it, do you have pictures or maybe he has questions? 
So that was a lot. I don't know. I do. I, yeah. I, I, it was a lot. <laughs> do you have yeah. any questions? You want to pause for questions? Yeah. Oh, I that's taught all year on zoom. So I'm used to like saying, okay, yeah. that's enough. Now let's pause and sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. I'm, I'm no. glad she's here because she, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did. Yes. I taught school on June on zoom all year. Yeah. 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 I know. Yeah. The pandemic. Wow. Changed everything. Um, for sure. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Okay. So focusing then on as you're directing the preschool and getting these kids as early as possible. Right. Yeah. And, and, we, we and, do, we do from one to four yeah. years old Okay. and, and, and neurologists and, and psychologists and cognitive experts understand between the ages of zero and four is the most yeah. important years in child development. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, underserved children, what they've found is that they will hear by the time they're three years old, 9 million words. And wow. for us, we think that's pretty sufficient but they found that resource families, and when they say underserved, what they're saying is it's not just uh, poor children. What they mean by underserved are very busy families that mm -hmm. are professionals, for example, and they don't have time or to spend with their children. Uh, and oftentimes children just get devices given to them perhaps, or just not a lot of time spent. And so they're classifying underserved as, as just time spent. Mm -hmm. And and that's 9 million words, whereas resourced families, those who spend the time, language, talking, those children will hear 42 million words. Wow. And so they're saying by the time a child is three years old, it, it if you haven't grabbed them at that moment, yeah. then it might be a difficult road ahead. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's where, the, you know, that's as, as a high school teacher in the States, and I'm sure yeah. there's many teachers listening and, and being part of this. Um, you know, we see a disparity between groups of students and this is where mm -hmm. it starts. Yeah. It starts yeah. at the lowest level because sure. those groups of kids are not given the same, mm -hmm. really it's the words it's, you know, that shapes their, their yeah. brain and increases yeah. their vocabulary. And that just continues that gap just yeah. continues from the time they're small unless you know, um, mm -hmm. interventions are, which is wow. what the preschool is. It really is an intervention yeah. for, uh, kids who would otherwise literally be on the street, like right. physically on the street while their parents are trying to make money to have food or locked in rooms. We have, we have, yeah. we have parents yeah. that said, if we, we didn't, we didn't have you, we would just lock our child in the room. And, and, uh -huh. and the other impact that, that why I want to say this is, is worth your time and attention and, and, mm -hmm. and as a missiological project, why we think it's significant is that, uh, uh, what they found uh, amongst neurologists, they say, is that children that have experienced prolonged toxic stress. Now, we all go through toxic stress. We all go through stress. Moving is stressful. Uh, changing jobs is stressful. Health it, it, you know, experiences are stressful. What they're saying is prolonged toxic stress, where it's mm -hmm. unrelenting in a child's life. They say it actually alters the brain architecture of a child. Oh, wow. But, mm -hmm. but by creating the safe space that we created, yeah. those same experts are also saying that the brain is malleable and able mm -hmm. to, to heal itself and create, create pathways where that child can, can develop in a healthier format. Even though they exit out of that and go into a very difficult environment, they still come back into it. Yeah. And so our kids come to us from 7 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. And, and the impact we're seeing is absolutely tangible and we have data behind it yeah not only touching the child's life but we've had um we've had sociologists secular sociologists have come toured our center one group came from qatar scott okay. and you know mm -hmm. the, you know they're secular so sociologists and this is what they found they 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 did a longevity study and they said we learned that it takes it takes one week for your children to enter into your, your, your early development center and, and embrace it immediately mm -hmm. and absolutely start thriving. Yeah. He said it takes two weeks to four weeks for a mother to see the impact in the child's life mm -hmm. and, and shifts her entire life. Yeah. She shifts everything to start supporting that. Wow. And he yeah. said the third thing is that you employ women, mm -hmm. all women. It's a women-led project. Yeah. And he said, and they're leading the way. They're absolutely taking this to a higher level. And he said, you know, as, as a sociologist, you're ticking everything off the
the charts. Mm. I mean, many of the women, many of the teachers are Syrian refugees themselves. Really? Like, wow. Them from Syria yeah. since 2011, you know, when the um, yeah. crisis started. Yes. When the war started. Yeah. So that's another, wow. um, so, another yeah. sort of demographic that the preschool is reaching yeah. um, because we're giving good, safe jobs for yeah. women in mm -hmm. the Middle East which that's amazing is, yeah not the safest place for women right uh, so I taught I taught in the yeah. Middle East so yeah yeah, yeah. extremely patriarchal and yes. um you know I was women are aggressed upon you know in various ways sure. and yeah so um, wow the, the preschool does that as well like it's a, a safe place that's, for women. that's amazing so oftentimes so, you know yeah. oftentimes I get people has a question yeah, yeah yeah sure oh I was just gonna say yeah it's it's just it's incredible to hear how the Lord orchestrates all these things, you know, um, cause you're, you're not just directing a preschool, you're impacting kids' lives for Christ. You're impacting adults' lives for Christ, the moms, Syrian refugees. It's just this incredible thing that God is doing, uh, through you all there in, in the middle East. And it's, it's amazing to see that. It's really cool to see that. Um, and we I know that, have, sorry. Oh, I was, no, I was, okay. I was just gonna say, I know that our people, uh, watching this video, um, are going to, I believe, really be impacted and touched by that, you know, and um, it's just, it's just a great thing to see how the Lord is at work uh, everywhere uh, in, in the world right now, you know, Out, outside of, of our bubbles, you know, God is, God is at work. That's right. God is at work, yeah, so you know, true. and yeah. And so what, um, what are just a couple questions here as we kind of begin to close, um, what are, a few specific ways that, that we can be praying for you guys. Um, how can our people connect with you? Uh, maybe through internet, email, or however that is, if they want to do maybe more digging into what you all are doing. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, so maybe like those two things, and then um, I'll just, I'll give you guys the final word and just anything else you'd like us to know, uh, you sure. know, here in, in these next seven or eight minutes that we have. So sure. thanks, yeah. thanks for having us. Of course. Sure. My pleasure. I, I love this. And I, I, I love to connect to the church. I'm excited mm -hmm. for that. For, well, here's, here's how uh, one, one way we connect. Um, oftentimes when people, uh, we invite you to come mm -hmm. and uh, we don't, we don't want huge teams. Give us four or five people that have a heart. We've had people that have come. We have had 84 year olds who have come. Wow. So yeah, if yeah. you're 84 years old out there and said, <laughs> I remember the, the, the kids called me and they said, you know, my, my mother is going to Lebanon. Is she going to be safe? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think she's going to be fine. She absolutely loved it. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and uh, we, we want you to come and spend a week with us. You work in the center. You're part yeah. of the team. You actually uh, are assigned uh, a, a teacher and you serve with her and, and you work the entire week with the children and the mm. parents uh, you engage with the parents. And so that's one way of connecting. The other way is you can find us online at the Philemon project.org. Should okay. I put it in the chat or no, will people have access to the chat on this? Uh, not to the chat, but we will in, we'll include have, a yeah. link to all of it. Yeah. So the yeah. Philemon project.org. That, yeah, that's all, a, all one word, the Feynman project. Yeah. Right. And so you can learn more about the work and what we're doing. And then uh, we share, shared a Dropbox with you with lots of pictures. Oftentimes when people come, they think it's, oh, it's a cute little preschool. Oh, it's a cute little preschool. That's what we're going to do. And they walk in and they're blown away. And what they're blown away was is the vastness, the impact we're having. It's not mm. just a preschool. It yeah. is a transformative network of people being touched. And so you see children being transformed and touched, parents being mentored and worked on, and the community actually being, uh, mm. being impacted. Yeah. So that, that's a way we can do it. The other way is uh, you, you can pray for us. We have some great news to share with you. Uh, today, we got the word that we've been looking at replicating our ministry. So the vision of our ministry is not just one of these centers, but multiple centers. And yeah. uh, the, we just got word that there, uh, it, an offer was made on a building, uh, another building site that they accepted. Wow. And so, so they're going to open a second preschool. Yes. Fantastic. That's amazing. 
And then we're also looking at moving into Aleppo, Syria with the Presbyterians in Syria. So wow. they visited and they're excited about that. And wow. so pray for us, wow. uh, uh, look at the work we're doing and then help us financially. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say you can give, it, mm-hmm. you know, right now Lebanon is in a horrific situation economically right. and right. Um, everybody's struggling there. Mm-hmm. Even, even with raising their salaries, which by God's grace, we were able to do yeah. this summer. It's still not really enough because yeah. everything their 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 currency the lira has been devalued and yeah. it, like we've experienced it firsthand this summer we were in shock right right how expensive everything is so if, if people are able and they're they would like to donate that that's yeah. a huge help as well yeah thank you great all right and yeah and then you know oftentimes people say well then you know what kind of impact the kingdom of god is it making i just want to share one story yeah i don't is there, is there time do i have time yep, it's, yep. you're seconds. good okay Absolutely. okay so yeah um so uh a few years ago we were working with a kurdish woman and with her with her child her child her name was urena and uh our staff was just noticing urena was in a tough little spot this little girl wasn't wasn't acclimating something was wrong and so our, one of our team leaders, her name is Nairi, and she said, asked the, the woman, you know, um, what's, what, what's, what can we do? How can we help? What we learned was she's a Syrian Kurd. She's living in a small room with five other families that are not her family. Her husband's in Turkey trying to get to Germany, and she doesn't have any prospect of getting a job. And so Nairi said, let's go to pastor and pray now. She, she brings her in and then, and so we pray and Nairi's praying and she's saying, Lord, I pray that, that, uh, uh, she, uh, she gets a job. She finds an apartment and her husband comes back from Turkey to join her here. Hmm. Now, why she was praying, Scott, I'm having a conversation with the Lord and I'm saying, those are beautiful words. Nairi's praying, but it's not going to happen. Hmm. I know she's not going to get a job because she can't get a work permit or the job she's going to get is low paying. Yeah. I know she's not going to get an apartment. And then I know her husband is going to try to get to Germany, not come back. Long story short, I, I travel back and forth. So I, I go back, I see her. She grabs me by my jacket and she says, pastor, guess what? I got a job. Wow. I travel back and forth several weeks later. I see her. She says, pastor, I got an apartment. You know where the story's going. Yeah. Her husband gets called. He's a he he's a, a, a metal worker that does very intricate designs. And so uh, there was a building project that brought him with a legal work permit to come back to Lebanon and paid him a great salary. Mm-hmm. Now they're, they're Muslims. Yeah. And she brought her husband into the office. And then there he was. Uh, and and this woman, she takes her elbow. And she hits him <laughs> and he jumps out of his chair. And he said, she said these words, she said, these are the people that cared for me when nobody else would. Hmm. She hits him again with her elbow. And she said, these are the people that took care of our daughter, Urena, when hmm. I was thinking about abandoning her and running. Yeah. And then the final thing she says is these people are Christians and hmm. so am I, and you can't wow. take that away from me. Yeah, good. And so we see how the Lord wow. uses this simple project yeah. to transform people's lives. Hmm. That's beautiful. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. <sighs> and no matter what kind of faith we have or don't have. Yeah. Because Robert always tells that story with him, like telling God it's yeah. not going to work. Not going <laughs> to work, God. Yeah. Not going to work. I mean, I was converted. Thankfully, God is yeah. not moved by, by that. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Right. Yeah, I know. It's that's incredible. Wow. Man, thank you for sharing that story. That's impact very impacting, very moving. And I, I love hearing uh accounts of what the Lord is up to in in predominantly Muslim countries. I mean, God is God is at work. Amen. God is at work drawing people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to himself. You know. Yeah. And if they're and I, yeah, I think it's so important that we as Christians in America and abroad. Yeah. Focus on being the hands and feet of Christ because Jesus met people's needs. He healed them. He gave them food. I think Mm -hmm. that's so important as 
American Christians, especially. I so I think that was, that's been kind of lost for a while. And I, I yeah. feel like we're getting back to that now. Mm -hmm. And this is the preschool is a really perfect example of that. Yeah. Cause we feed the kids too breakfast yeah. lunch two snacks okay. so it's a very tangible yeah it's not just here here's the thing to follow jesus it's a very tangible um way of showing god's love wow yeah amazing love it word and indeed amen, amen. i love it amen. i love it yeah. well robert and joyce uh man god bless you guys thank you so much thanks for Matt. your time and and uh i'm sure our folks are gonna really really be moved by uh, watching your account of what God is doing through you all there in, in Lebanon and, and beyond. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all right. so much, everyone. Thank you, guys. Okay. Well, we will be praying for you all, and uh, I'm sure this will not be the last time we connect. So Great. I'm yeah. happy to come and visit. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll make sure that our people have uh, you know the website and all of that, and they can, they can stay in touch with you all. So Thank, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Right. God bless you all. Thank, thank you. you. All right.